Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Our next guest is here to tell tell us about a subject that's concerning us all, especially here in the small business area. Uh, as everybody knows, the Senate and the House have each passed the new tax uh, plans. They now have to reconcile them. We have uh, author and CPA Tom Wheelwright here to talk about the uh, the potential tax plan impact plan impacts on small business and what might be happening in, in the con- conference congressional conferences. Tom, welcome to the program. Great, thanks very much. Great to be on the program. Uh, Tom, tell us first a little bit about your background, which is fairly unique. And uh, before we get into anything else. Well, I uh, actually, I was in Washington, D.C. the last time I had major tax reform, 1986, with the National Tax Office of Ernst & Young. And uh, that was fascinating back then. I've uh, also been an adjunct professor at ASU for 14 years. I uh, run my own CPA firm for 25 years and uh, wrote uh, Tax Your Wealth. Most of what I do is educate entrepreneurs, small businesses like uh, uh, our listeners here, on how to permanently reduce their taxes. Well, that's really terrific. Your, your website, before we go any further? It is TaxFreeWealthAdvisor.com. TaxFreeWealthAdvisor.com. Thank you. Can you spell it out for our audience? I I can. It's tax, T-A-X, free, F-R-E-E, wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, advisor, A-D-V-I-S-O-R.com. Well, uh, from here on in, I'm going to turn you over to Dan because this this is this is an area that he knows well and you know well. So go to it, Dan. Thank you. And good morning, Tom. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, good morning. So great to be with you. Yeah, um, we have two competing bills, House and Senate. Um, some, I would say, some elements of similarity and some great uh, divergences between the two processes. Um, I think um, the, the first question that I would like to ask you, um, do you think we're going to get a bill? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, everybody wants the corporate tax reform. Uh, nobody's uh, arguing about that. I mean, frankly, if the Democrats were included, they'd probably even vote for the corporate ta- uh, tax reform. It's the rest of it that's, I think, challenging for people, um, particularly the individual provisions. But in order to pay for the corporate tax reform, you, you've got to raise the money somewhere. Tom, um, I, I write commentary for a lot of blogs, and I recently wrote a commentary about the tax bill and <clears throat> uh, have been uh, dismayed at, at the, 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 the logic or lack thereof in both houses. Um, both seem to be driven by a static model of revenue neutral driven by an evaluation done by the Congressional Budget Office. Our economy is anything but static. In fact, um, you may have seen yesterday where the president says that uh, he thinks it's possible to achieve a 6% growth in GDP. Now, Two weeks ago, Goldman put out a, an ish, a, a review for 2018, and they think it's possible that it could be 4% or a little higher, numbers we haven't seen in a long, long time. I often wonder why <clears throat> we use a revenue neutral um, bias when one of the alternatives is to cut the budget. So I, I'm still dismayed that we have both houses. Nobody seems to be talking about, I know that's a broad statement, nobody, but do you think there's a possibility that m- what might come out of this is some budget reductions? Uh, it, it's interesting. Actually, I was just reading this morning. Uh, I, I know that's on Paul Ryan's uh, list, the budget reduction, and I know that it's, it's, it's quite a bit separate from the tax bill. I don't think it will be part of the tax bill. Um, you know, the, the, the neutrality of tax bills goes way back into the 80s. 
um, when uh, the Senate passed, um, a, a, they, they passed legislation that said that any tax bill had to be revenue neutral. So it's it's really a um, a function that they decided long ago that they were going to do revenue neutral, and they haven't changed that, and probably won't. But the the concern that I have, Tom, is that <clears throat> excuse me. If you look at our budgets, <laughs> our budgets are in deficit. We've got $20 trillion of outstanding debt. Where's the revenue neutral there? Where is the offset? Where is the <laughs> – it, it, it didn't happen. Exactly. So, you know. No, it's, it's absolutely true, and, and that's what happens when you, when, you, when you have different rules for different things. So we have mm-hmm. – you know, it, it's, like, it's like the 1986 Act was revenue neutral, and yet the 1986 Act caused the real estate crisis of 1989, which was, caused huge federal deficits. So you can say mm-hmm. the bill itself was revenue neutral, but the effects certainly weren't revenue neutral. Right. So what, what do you see out of the two branches, the House and the Senate? What do you see? <clears throat> and then I have a very specific question for myself as a small businessman that I know affects a lot of other small businessmen. What do you, what do you see that will be positive for small business out of looking at both bills and likely to survive? Well, well, I think there's a lot of positive in both bills for small business. I mean, certainly the the, the expensing uh, expensing of all equipment is positive. The reduction in uh, the depreciation lives for real estate is very positive. A lot of small businesses own real estate. Um, that's a huge positive. Um, you know, they they eliminated like kind of exchanges, the 1031 exchange for um, a lot of people, but. Like for ranchers, for example, they're eliminated, but for real estate, they maintained it. Um, they maintained the carried interest rule as long as you have it for three years. For you know, small businesses that, that are starting a business, that can be a very important um, provision. And then even, even though we're not getting parity, um, you know, small businesses we think of as being flow through because most of us are. And you know, we go, well, there's not parity with the corporate reduction, um, and, and that's true it's still a reduction. So we're still getting a tax reduction. So that is still positive. Well, well, you know, people can argue all day long, is it fair? Um, the question is, is it positive? It's absolutely positive because it's a reduction either on the Senate side in uh, a, a deduction or on the House side in a lower rate. So I think there's a, a huge amount of positives for small business in this bill. Let me ask you a very specific question that I know affects everybody like myself and Don who are uh, LLCs and, and uh, or partnerships right. or whatever that it's flow through. Um, I I don't know the exact term, but I I I can tell you what I call it. There appears to be a tax penalty, which I have to pay for being a small business, uh, and 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 it can be quite expensive. Uh, it's a supplemental tax that I have to pay because I am a small business. And in my case, I'm a single employee small business. And, and you know, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars in this tax. Do you know what I'm talking about? Which, which provision are you talking about? You're talking about the effect on, of, the, of the flow-through rates? Are you talking no. about, the, uh, are you talking about the, 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 the net investment income tax? Which, which provision are you referring to? There's a there, currently there is a uh, an item on my on you know, my uh, 1041 or 1040 whatever it is where I okay. have to pay a tax an additional tax because I'm I'm a small business. Oh, um, you're talking about the the Medicare tax. Nope, nope. There's another tax. <laughs> There's too many taxes. I wish I could be more. Uh, Articulate for you, but I last year it was over ten thousand dollars. It's because I'm self-employed or I have a, a pass-through entity. I have to pay an additional tax, and I don't know whether that's is is that a, an additional social security tax? Um, oh, there there is that. Well, sure. I mean, you, you, if if you're organized as a general partnership or you're organized as a sole proprietor. You're, you, you pay a hundred. You pay social security tax on a hundred percent of the income from your business. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Yep. But is 
there's <clears> there, 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 there ways there are ways to deal with that. I mean, there are ways to avoid that. So, um, but you're right. That is that is there. So I'm I'm paying a tax, uh, and I'm wondering if 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 I could if I could say this right. When when I pay my quarterly taxes, my estimated quarterly taxes, uh, right. and I, I'm I'm paying it to the general treasury. I'm assuming that a portion of that is the the social security taxes that I would have to pay as an individual. Absolutely. And I'm wondering, if, it, it, I'm wondering if I, the corporation, my LLC, is also assessed the employee employer half. Of the Social Security taxes, you, you do. You pay both sides because you're both the employer and the employee, so you are paying both sides right. of that tax. Absolutely. Okay, so that that's probably what the tax is I'm talking about. It's my my corporate Social Security tax. So it's in a, in a sense, is it fair to say in in that situation, Tom, that my LLC is not a true pass through because the LLC has a tax liability because it is an LLC. Well, they, no, no, it, it is a true pass-through. So in other words, whether you were an LLC or you were a sole proprietor, um, you would pay the same amount of Social Security tax. So, it, I mean, it actually, you're paying all of it, okay? The LLC pays no yeah. tax. You're paying all of it, but you're paying both the, the employer side and the employee side. So it's okay. really flow through. I okay. mean, it's like extra, super duper. You get double tax. <laughs> okay, so let's let's deal with uh, right now. It's what advice are you giving your clients that they should or shouldn't do between now and the end of the year while we're waiting for this bill to come out? Well, you know, there there are some things that are. Uh, retroactive and there's some things that because they're not retroactive effectively you have some opportunities so for example if you live on the coast and you've got um, a state income uh, an estimated tax payment for your state due in January you're going to want to make that now because that's not going to be deductible likely when you if you make it in January same with property taxes you know you, you if you can pre if you can pay your March property tax Okay, or your May property tax now, you're probably going to be better off. So there's that. And then some of the expensing provisions of the new bill come into effect this year, 2017. So if you've got, if, if you've been thinking about large capital expenditures anyway, and you're thinking about should I make them, you know, you can make them now and get the tax benefit in 2017. You don't have to wait until the tax bill, you know, until next year. Uh, you know, to get those benefits. So there are things that you can do. The other thing that you ought to really be looking at is because the corporate rate comes down to 20%, I think every small business has to look at, should we now be not a pass-through? Should we now be a corporation? Should we tax as a corporation? Because they're so low, if we're not taking all of the money out of our business, if we're reinvesting a lot of the money into our business because we're growing the business, there's, there's a whole new incentive now to be a, a C corporation, a tax corporation instead of a flow through. But if I'm if I'm uh, <clears throat> a small business and I use this, the small business provides uh, most of my income, so then I'm I'm draining a lot of the money out of the corporation. Then if I if I went to a C corporation, wouldn't I have double taxation on on some of that revenue coming out? You would, you would. What 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 the what the tax bill, particularly the house bill, does is it effectively brings corporations and flow throughs to the same tax level if you're at the highest rate. So if you're at a 39.6 percent rate individually in a flow through, you would pay 39.6 percent, but you're getting, but there's 30 percent of that, 30 percent of that under the house bill that would be taxed at 25 percent. Rate, which effectively brings you to a 32% rate. If if you were to be a corporation, you would pay 20%, but then you'd pay an additional um, 15 to 20% on the 80% that you distribute, and you end up at a 32% rate too. So you actually end up with parity between the two. So you're right. If you <clears throat> distribute most of your income, you're probably still better off being a flow through. Yeah, it seems to me that. Um, 
looking at the provisions uh, uh, in both both sets of bills, you said some of the provisions are retroactive. <clears throat> Is there are there a couple of things that uh, that you can tell our audience that you think you got to do this or don't do that? Uh, uh, something that, that they can look at their business. I mean, you talked about. Um, the changing in the depreciation schedule for both real estate and, and the expensing of uh, uh, plant and equipment, uh, does that, is that retroactive or is that going to affect next year? It is. Well, I, I, the, the, the depreciation, I believe, goes in effect next year, but the expensing uh, increase is going to affect this year. So I, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, for one thing, make your state estimated tax payment uh, in December, okay, that's an absolute must. You must make it this year because you may not even get it next year. It's not just timing this time. Um, another thing that, that really you ought to be looking at is, um, you know, a lot of businesses wonder, should I own real estate? Well, if you ever were wondering, this would be a time that you would really uh, add in the tax consequences to that because they can be significant to owning your building instead of renting your building. Um, a lot of tax benefits in real estate in this, in this bill. So that's another thing I'd be looking at for sure. Um, one of the things that uh, we're, we should talk a little bit about is uh, how are um, pension plans affected, if any, by the law? You know, they're, they're really not. I mean, uh, we thought they were going to be. It, it looked like uh, they were going to affect 401k plans and that they were going to have some, some re- re- restrictions there. And the one thing that they're doing is, and, and here's something that you might want to consider, um, is that they are going to restrict the rollover from a regular IRA to a Roth IRA. So if you're considering that, this is something you ought to sit down with your tax advisor before the end of the year and say, look, should we be should we be looking at this rollover this year instead of uh, waiting because that rollover is is going away in both bills. So there will be no provision to roll from a regular IRA to a Roth, uh, assuming that, that the bills pass in in going that's, forward in 2018. That's correct. <clears throat> wow, so that that's off the table. Um, it is. Any other, any other surprises? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think there are going to be – I actually think there's going to be a lot of surprises. The, the Senate bill is a very odd bill because it's very – it's got a lot of details in it, so you really need to look at your industry. I mean, for example, there's special rules for citrus growers. There's special re- rules for um, beer importers. Um, there's all sorts of special rules in the Senate bill, so – you know, you, you got to look at your industry. Make sure you talk to your industry, you know, your your industry association, and and find out what's in there. Because if if you're in one of those industries that's affected, it can be a real plus for you. So I I think the surprises. I don't think the surprises are going to be necessarily negative. I think I think some of the surprises people are going to find are going to be positives because there are some tax benefits in that bill that you can you can tell that what happened was is that Senator Hatch went to each senator and said what will it take for you to sign off on this bill and they got little provisions in there and you know they have to it's the senate that's driving this not the house the house has the votes no matter what the senate needs every single vote yeah so um how do you feel about miss miss pelosi's description of the tax bill being armageddon and we're all going to die <laughs> um well <laughs> This is the same person who said, let's pass uh, Obamacare first and then we'll read it. <clears throat> yes. We, can't, we don't know what's in it until after we pass it. <clears throat> it it's exactly. unbelievable. We, we're not going to know what's in it until after we pass it. Now we know what's in it. And, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting is, is eliminating that individual mandate. And the question is whether they'll do anything about the employer mandate, which it doesn't look like they will. So that's another little thing that people haven't been talking about is that while mm-hmm. you're no longer mandated as an individual to buy insurance, as an employer, mm-hmm. if you have over 50 employees, you're still mandated in offering insurance. Wow. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, there's, a, there's a provision in going back to retirement plans. Uh, there's a provision of if you are covered by a SEP IRA, especially if you're a small business, single, single entrepreneur, 
there is a provision that allows you to set up, I think the current number is like $53,000 up to 25% of your of your adjusted right. growth or pre-tax income up to $53,000, uh, which is a huge, huge benefit for a small business that has a, a SEP IRA. Is, is that going to stay or is that going to disappear? Uh, everything I've seen, that's staying. So wow. that, yeah, that, that, I mean, the same is true with a, you know, uh, 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 um, solo 401k has the same provision in it. Uh, yeah. Everything I've seen says it's going to stay. Is the 401k as, as generous as the SEP IRA at 53000 It is. The, the solo 401k and the SEP IRA work the same. Okay, okay. Um, Dan, let me nope. Dan, let me jump in here for a moment um, uh, and uh, ask our guest uh, to t- tell us his website again because I'm getting all sorts of call, calls that they want want to. Uh, Tom Wilwright, tell us your website again. It is taxfreewealthadvisor.com, taxfreewealthadvisor.com, and it's named after my book, Tax Free Wealth. So if, if you really want to understand the tax law, Tax Free Wealth, I, I made it really simple, and it's available everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, et cetera. Well, uh, I, I've been fascinated by this conversation, so I'm going to turn it right back to you, Dan. Thank you. Um so, um, Tom, I wanted to uh, move on to uh, this, the, the political problem, if, if that's the, uh, I'm not sure that that's the right way to address it, but clearly the tax, as I understand the tax bill, if you live in, on the coast, in New York, New Jersey, California, Massachusetts, very high tax states, uh, there's going to be either elimination of the tax deduction for state income tax or a significant reduction or a cap. Is that going to go through? Uh, for sure, for sure. One, one, one thing they're looking at, though, is uh, they're, they're going to cap it at 10000 Whether that means capping it to only be property tax or being a choice of property tax or income tax or sales tax, we don't know that, but they are, uh, it, it looks for sure that they're going to cap it at ten thousand dollars. Now, there's a discussion about increasing the standard deduction, doubling the standard deduction, and uh, right. some people feel that their analysis is that by by uh, <clears throat> increasing the standard deduction, you may take a lot of people um, who might have been able to deduct. Uh, mortgage interest or, or real estate taxes or state taxes and by doubling the itemized or doubling the standard deduction you're going to pick up a number of people who um, will still benefit from the increasing of the doubling of the standard exemption yeah that's for so they're, sure. going to, they're mean, going to gain it, something of what they lose they are now what 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 people sim- seem to miss is that they also lose their personal exemptions so if you have you know, if, if you have kids under 18, that's made up with the tax credit. But losing those personal exemptions, uh, in in some cases, is going to mean that you're, even though your standard deduction has doubled, you may still end up with a tax increase because of losing the personal exemptions. I think it's, as I recall, I live in Florida. There is no state income tax, but there is property right. tax in the state of Florida. Uh, we, we, unlike where Don lives in New Jersey, who has state and maybe even local income tax in addition to federal plus some of the highest real estate tax rates in the country, those key centers uh, of high taxation, are they going to be really adversely affected by this? I mean, significantly adversely affected or not? You know, it's possible. I I think probably less than people think. And and for one reason is that a lot of those people are losing their um, state tax deduction through the alternative minimum tax now anyway. So Mm -hmm. because you don't get it for alternative minimum tax purposes, right? So a a lot of those people that, you know, get big because they have big state taxes because they, they're making decent money in their small business. um, You know, they're losing that benefit anyway. So I don't think it's as big as people might think it is. I actually think that the mortgage interest deduction will have uh, a, a, a major effect on the coast because 
you're going to see a little bit of pressure on property prices um, when when you if you if you reduce the mortgage interest deduction down to a five hundred thousand dollar cap. Wow. So that the the um, the well the the tax revenue to the state won't be affected. It's just the deductibility of the tax from the uh, for st- federal purposes, right? Right. I mean, the, the argument is is that a low tax state like Florida, a no tax state like Florida, or a low tax state like Arizona, where I am, um, the, mm-hmm. effectively we're subsidizing those states, okay, because right. of the of the of the state tax deduction. That's the argument. So um, mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, the states themselves. Um, aren't affected, but the uh, the uh, but the voters sure are, <laughs> for sure. Well, uh, then uh, can I jump in here and, and ask Tom sure. a question? Uh, I'm in New Jersey, and we have the highest uh, property taxes in, in the nation uh, per capita. And um, uh, the only way uh, local and state government has really to uh, uh, finance schools is by the property tax. But it, um, um, and the headlines have been from the last week that um, doomsday is upon us because this, uh, these bills will uh, affect, the, um, uh, affect them. If I heard you correct, you're saying it will probably just r- reduce the upward um, a desirability uh, price of, of homes, but uh, I, I would think it would have to start uh, politicians to reassess how they uh, raise uh, money. Am I right or wrong? Oh, I I, I think that it, it, it might. Now, property taxes, you know, you know, when typically when we get a bond election, we're we're told that well, you just have to reduce how much you eat at McDonald's once a week, right? You know. Or once a month, or something like that. It's not that that big a number. I think that what what the the concern is is that if you put pressure on the prices, remember, but the, the the value of those homes is driving uh, the amount of property tax. And so, if the value of those homes goes down, your the property tax collected goes down. And I, I think that that's a bigger I think that's a bigger concern, okay, than the actual deduction of the property tax. Hmm. No, it, it, um, it's all it's all Greek to me, uh, to quote Shakespeare. Yeah. But uh, um, uh, if I could ask one question, on the whole, do you think the small business benefit has benefited from this change, or uh, remained the same, or been hurt by these changes? The, in your opinion, there's no there's no question. There's tremendous benefits to small business in both of these bills. Um, through through um, ex- expensing uh, the equipment, through the real estate depreciation deduction, through um, the, the 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 reduction in the flow through tax rate, um, through the corporate tax rate, because a lot of small businesses do have do, you know our taxes corporations. You know, there's a provision that if you're just starting a small business, um, there's a provision that if if you start it as a corporation, as a C corporation, a taxable corporation, and you sell it. After five years, there's no tax on the gain. So that's a huge benefit to small business that typically because of the lack of flowing through the losses in the early years and the high tax rate, of the 35% tax rate, when startups have gone, well, no, we're going to start as a flow through like a, a, a partnership or uh, you know, an S corporation. We're going to start as a flow through. Then eventually we may have to be a corporation. But with this new bill, you know, with this new, these new provisions, that's a huge benefit. If you're doing, a, if you're starting a small business and you're thinking, boy, in five, six, seven years, I'm going to sell this thing, you could actually completely avoid the gain by doing that. Dan, you get to ask so the last I, question. Oh darn, only one. Uh, so, following what you were just saying there, Tom, if I were, if I were an LLC, would I would I be better off to reincorporate as a as a C corporation, you might be. You might be, and it's really easy to make the change. In fact, under the law, they're making it really, really easy to make the change. Um, they're 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 putting some transition rules in. They're really trying to make it easy to to change to that C corporation um, under both bills. So I I think you'll find that you'll do the analysis, sit down with your advisor, 
do the analysis, make sure it makes sense for you in the long run. And then I think that, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to reassess every single client and look at should we be a C corporation, at least for some of the businesses. There's no capital gains at the shareholder level. No capital gains. Whoa. Okay? So it, you can't convert. You've got to start. As uh, now, there's some planning you can do to, you know, like you say, you if you're, you know, if you're you're small enough, you can probably just start new, right? But if you start as uh-huh. a as a corporation, not an LLC, but and now it can be an LLC tax as a corporation, okay? So you can do that. But if you start as a corporation, then the gains when you sell your stock are not subject <clears throat> to capital gains tax if you hold it for five wow. years. Wow. That's, 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 that was worth the call. <laughs> Alone. There you go. Uh, uh, Tom, <laughs> uh, does that, uh, is it that for uh, companies going forward or for companies uh, backwards as well? You know, that provision's been in there for a long time, okay? So this is not that, – that's not what's new. What's new is now there's an additional incentive because we've got such low corporate tax rates now you have to say, look, we know that when we start a business, we're going to have losses for the first year or two. We like to use those losses to offset income from our wages, right? But let's say our spouse is not starting a business and, and he or she has wages, and we'd like to use those losses and get that tax benefit now, which you lose in a corporation. But the long-term benefit now is so good with a 20% tax rate, and then if you do sell, you get no capital gains. I think there's going to be – I mean, I'm certainly going to encourage more of my clients to set up as a C-corporation. Oh, the, Tom, we're, we're talking with Tom Wheelwright, he's CPA, a CPA and author, about the differences in the House Senate versions of, of the tax bill. Uh, uh, we're going to invite Tom back as soon as the uh, bills are reconciled to tell us what's in it. Don't you agree, Dan? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I would Tom, love to do that. Uh, please do. Let's uh, stay in touch. And thank you. And tell us once again your website. It is Tax Free Wealth, like the book, Tax Free Wealth Advisor dot com. Tax Free Wealth Advisor dot com. Tom, th- th- thank, thank you, Tom. you so much for being with us. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your recap Calculating.biz featured book. Our next guest is Sandra Mansfield. She is, I love this title, Chief Chalk Officer for Chalk of the Town. She's here because along with her partner, they have a unique company we want her to tell our listeners about. Uh, Sandra, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, by way of explanation, um, well, uh, we we saw Sandra's uh, company at, at a show in New York, uh, 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 at an advanced look at the uh, Toy Fair 2018. And uh, when we saw her product, uh, we being my wife and I, we said it had to be on the program. Sandra, tell us uh, why you're chief chalk, uh, chalk officer and what your product is. Sure. Um 
our product is, and when I say our, my sister and I started this company, and we developed the product together. And what our product is, it's a T-shirt with a chalkboard area on it where you can draw, and you can wear the T-shirt, you can erase the design, and reuse the chalkboard and T-shirt and wear it over and over again. But it's, it, ch- while chalk works on the chalkboard, what is very unique and wonderful about the uh, this product that we invented and wrote a patent for is that you can write on the surface with precise, sharp, um, brilliantly colored chalk markers. When you write with the chalk markers uh, after the the ink dries, which takes a short time, maybe a minute or two, the ink does not smudge. And so you can go about wearing your shirt with your design on it. And um, and when you're ready to erase it, you can uh, wet a cloth, wipe it, and redraw. Or if you'd like need to wash the shirt, you can throw the shirt in the washing machine, and it'll be ready for your next wear. Well, how, how did you come up with this idea, and how long did it take you to develop it? Well, that's a very good question. Um, my sister and I started making some T-shirts for a vacation area um, called Fire Island. It's near New York City, um, where we had spent some uh, parts of summers, and we thought that the T-shirts, the T-shirts there weren't so interesting. And we said, you know what, we can we could design some. My sister, who is a graphic designer, and myself, who is an engineer, um, got together, came up with some designs, and sold our Sure. To this, it's basically a summer community, um, and the shirts were well received. But the designs were very, very specific for this community. And so, in order for us to grow our business, we'd have to find other communities and come up with T-shirts that were relevant for them. And that's a lot of work. It's not really scalable. So we said, "Gee." What if we were able to change the design? And, you know, it's not that simple. We also saw trends in products, home products with chalkboard surfaces on them. You know, you see gloves and stickers. You see lots of things uh, with chalkboard surfaces on it. Uh, So we kind of put all of that together and said, I I, I think we can create a shirt where you can change the design. So while we were selling uh, these products, to the Fire Island communities, we were working on developing our T-shirt. And, uh, you know, I would say we worked on it part-time for a year and then uh, ramped up our efforts. And we went to market August of last year. So we're rather new uh, compared to some of the other businesses that you have come talk on this program. We're rather new, um, but we've... uh, you know, very much enjoyed the ride. It's it's been fascinating and and interesting, to say the least. Well, before we go any further, uh, what's your website? Oh, sure. It's www dot chalk dash of dash the dash town dot com. It is a mouthful. Uh, but it's there. You can also search on Google under chalkboard T-shirt, and you'll find us, Chalk of the Town. We're the only chalk marker, chalkboard T-shirt. Um, I know that because we invented it and we wrote a patent for it. Okay. I'm going to turn you over to, to Dan now because um, I'm sure he has some questions. <laughs> okay, sure. I do. If you're, a, if you're the chief chalk officer, is there chalk a chief? Officer? Yeah. Is there a chief eraser officer? Uh, I'm probably that too. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to come up with titles when you're a business with two people, two you know full time people. Um, how do you come up with the titles? Do I say you know um, uh, chief you know financial officer? Uh, you know charge of logistics, in charge of packages. Like, how do you divide it up? So we just decided chief talking officer sounded good. Okay. So you're, um, uh, are you, where are you making your shirts? Uh, well, we 
get components from some different places, but we compile it all together here. Um, what probably would be helpful for you to understand is how we actually sell our product. Um, our product is sold in kits right now. Um, it's sold with one T-shirt, one chalk marker, a stencil, and a cloth. And the product is packaged and marketed uh, to be a product for kids as a, as a kit. We also sell colored markers on the side and additional stencils. That said, uh, as we've been selling this product for kids, we've also uh, had such a demand and request for um, adult versions of the shirt. And when I say adult, I mean um, you know, adult sizes. So we, as we speak this week, we're working on getting um, adult shirts up on our website and also giving people the opportunity to purchase shirts individually. Uh, what we've found is um, while there's a nice kit that makes a nice gift you know, with the, everything you need to create a shirt, um, a lot of times families were buying these products and they needed shirts and a few markers, but they didn't need double duty on some of the elements. So um, we're introducing that this week up on our website. So does the shirt come in the package with the chalkboard already on it? Oh, yes. So, yes, yes, absolutely. It's a, Cotton, 100% cotton T-shirt, and it has, um, through a patented process, a chalkboard on it. And right now we offer shirts in the shape of a, um, a speech bubble or, or a text box. It, it sort of looks like a text box on a um, phone and also a heart. And we found that those two shapes encompass um, a lot of needs. Okay. And what does the package sell for? Um, the self, the product, uh, the packaged product sells for twenty eight dollars. Again, it includes the t shirt, a stencil, a chalk marker, a cloth, directions, and some design ideas. But we're going to be offering, you know, like I said, another version where you can buy those pieces um, deconstructed, so to speak, so that you can buy exactly okay. what you want. So, what have your sales been like? Um, They've been they've ramped up over time, which is exactly what you want. <laughs> um, we're very new. Um, we're selling. One thing that I didn't explain is our product is available at stores. We're in about 150 stores, and like I said, you can also buy our product on the website. And we also have made we've been making product for some specific corporations and businesses where uh, we'll custom make a chalkboard shape or package a product a certain way. Uh, so our product is avail available in a bunch of different ways, and um, the mix of sales is changing. So the uh, the stores that you're selling in, any national brands? And any national stores? Uh, no. All the, the stores that we're in right now are all more sort of local – some have multiple locations, um, you know, in different areas, but not not the big department stores. No. So, so, so you and your executive team have you figured out where this business <laughs> is going? Um, we do have some ideas. Um, I'm apprehensive to talk about them in great detail um, because, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, there is competition out there, and there are people who are um, trying to um, copy elements of what we're doing. So I'm a little bit paranoid, I must admit. Um, okay. But we have we have learned a lot. Um, we've learned about what works, what doesn't work. We're learning um, social media is so important, and it's so much more important than we ever expected. Um, it's such a great way to connect with customers and interact with them and to really highlight target um, target potential customers. And I have to admit, that's not something I learned about when I went to business school. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. the internet, I guess, was an email at that point, but, um, you know, how to market using um, Facebook and Instagram and it was something that didn't learn. So I'm in the process of trying to learn that through trial and error, trying different promotions trying to uh and all this it's it's a it's a new world out there it's fascinating 
yes. fascinating. So I, I, I want to I want to make a suggestion, two suggestions. Sure. But I, I also, as a result of those two suggestions, I want to ask a question. So let me ask sure. the question first. What is your maximum capacity at the moment? Um, well, I would say infinity because I don't own um, the production facilities, so I can add um, other production facilities online, like use different – we have a couple different facilities that we've trained to make our product and, you know, that we've signed agreements with them, uh, you know, with confidentiality and all of that. So I can um, – I guess my capacity would be a function of theirs, but being that there's a number of different businesses, um, it could it could be infinite. So you would would you be comfortable of of me saying your business is very scalable? You could ratchet up production quickly. What, what do you say is quickly? Uh, what happens if tomorrow you got an order for ten thousand shirts? I could produce that. Give me six weeks, and I can deliver. Okay. And in six weeks' time, um, will the customers have lost interest if you can't supply them inventory for six weeks? And you're talking about our, uh, like a, a corporate customer. I'm saying if you if you're looking at um, looking at an arrangement where you pick up a broader distribution. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, they send you an order tomorrow for twelve thousand shirts, and they say, "I want it in three weeks." What are you going to say to them? You know what? I've learned that that customers that order amounts that large um, expect a discount, and they, in turn, give you more time to produce. Um, lots and lots of people in these kinds of businesses not myself at this point, are producing overseas. So their production uh, lead times are more like six months. Um, okay. So it would be unusual in my ex- experience to have a request like that, but possible. Would they lose interest okay. if it was something that they wanted right away? Um, what I found, the people that are interested in our product and get it, um, it's too bad that it isn't a visual with this discussion because you would you would. Re- Oh, I get it. I see it. Um, uh, when people love this product, they are bought into it. So if that's what I said to them, I'd like to think that they would stick stick with it. Um, what okay. the way that we operate, we try to be very transparent about what we can and can't do. Um, I want happy customers. Um, if they're happy, they'll come back. Um, if we give them what they need, then you know they'll ask for more and they'll you know give recommendations to other folks. Uh, to use us to to solve whatever need they're trying to um, fill. Do you think that your product, yes, do you think your product is an impulse sale or is it game changing? That's a really good question. Is it an impulse sale or is it game changing? I only get paid for the good ones. I don't get paid for the bad ones. Yeah, no, you you just, you you saved it and then you're like, okay, I'm going to stick that in there. Um, I think it depends on which, outlet you're talking about. If you're talking about a retail clothing outlet, I'm going to say impulse. If you're talking about okay. at a camp where someone uh, sees another person using that shirt for field day and then in the play at camp because they needed a quick prop and they see it, you know, them wearing it with their BFF, it's not a impulse purchase. It's a, I want that because I want to have that shirt that I can change the design for my birthday uh, to cheer on my team for anything else. So okay. I guess it depends on the situation and the person. Um, okay. You know, what, one way our t-shirt was used recently that I loved was um, someone used, they called me up and they asked me up for shirt, shirts to wear in Race for the Cure, you know, the a fundraising event for breast cancer. And uh, mm-hmm. she and her team wore the shirts, and they were able to personalize their shirts instantly. With and it, it was relevant because 
everyone had a different reason why they were walking in this breast cancer walk, you know, for Aunt Tilly or for themselves or, or they had something different to say. And so it was really mm-hmm. easy for them to personalize it. So when you look at something like that, it's a, it's a game changer uh, okay. in, in that respect. Are you profitable? Uh, at the Dan, can I jump in with a question? Um, <laughs> sure. Sandra, uh, do, do you offer all sizes of men and women and children or just children? Or, or uh, how do you uh, 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 handle your SKUs? That's all a good question. Um, we Right now we have lots of – we have inventory um, in kid sizes and – we are just saying we're just introducing adult. We're just putting adults on our website this week. Um, so kids and adults, and how do we ma- ma- manage it? SKUs. You know, um, I can see <laughs> before before um, before I did this and before I had my kids and uh, when uh, my first job out of college, I worked. In um, management consulting, I'm, I'm an industrial engineer, and I worked in sort of operations improvements and stuff like that. And you know, we work with clients to help them manage skew proliferation. <laughs> um, every time you add another size, color, it just it can get really out of hand because it's just so much more work. And now I'm living it. So we're trying to um, to manage that. Um, we introduced with two colors. We added a few more colors. But you know we've done some analysis to figure out that it doesn't necess- it's not necessarily adding in- incremental customers. So we're trying to pull back on some of that. Um, it's so easy to do. I see how it is. You have a you know a customer that really wants X. You offer it and it gets kind of out of control. And there's a lot of costs that are involved in in doing that. Did I answer your question? Back to you, Dan. Uh, she's a fascinating. Uh, study. I, I, I love their product. Yeah. <laughs> so um, are you profitable? Uh, well, what, what, we, we, we launched 14 months ago. Um, we're running our business to grow. And with that means investing, which means we're reinvesting our profits in inventory um, and infrastructure, um, bringing on some different experts in different areas to help us. I think when, when I was in business school, I, I think I, I, I learned that you don't necessarily have to be profitable day one, but that should be your, your goal over time. So that's what that's how it works. Let me, let me throw you now, after all of this grilling, let me throw you a suggestion. I'll, I'll take it. I, go ahead. Yeah. Get, go on the web, go to ABC Television, go to Shark Tank, and find out how you get on the show. If I had um, if I had a nickel for everyone who suggested that, yeah, no, I, it's something we're thinking about and we're considering. We're we're definitely considering that. Um, we see that the product has legs in so many different industries, um, market se- market segments, industries, uh, kids, adults, uh, and uh, going to under Shark Tank for the. Um, pure publicity as well as potentially capital to help fund us to do some of those things would be would be invaluable so and that's where i disagree with you having talked <laughs> to people who have tried to get on uh, shark tank and have been on shark tank the real problem with that is that you sign away a lot of your future profits to be on the show um the, they require you to guarantee that you'll give up a certain percentage of your company to them. Uh, is, is that and how it seems to me now? that Sandra and her sister have a pretty good head uh, uh, on what their business is and uh, uh, seem to be doing a, a really great job at it. What, what do you think, Dan? Well, I, I, I'm not suggesting that they're signing away their lives. I'm suggesting that they might want to consider talking to them and find out, uh, based on what I've heard so far, um, these are not uh, these are not novices. They understand their business. They understand things like skews and skew points, and and uh, and they understand the profit dynamics of their business. Um, I'm just saying is it might be interesting to see what it could entail. You don't have to sign anything, but you you have a unique enough product. The fact that you have a you have a a, a patent on it says a lot about 
how you have some protection uh, on your uniqueness. So just just a, 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 a something to think about. Okay. Well, no, uh, uh, Sandra, I guess, where are you located, and uh, uh, who put up your website? Uh, well, uh, we're located in two cities, actually. This is a good question. I live in uh, New York City. I'm based in New York City, and my sister and business partner is based in Columbus, Ohio. So we – Go Bucks. <laughs> yeah, go Bucks. Exactly. Yes, you'll see lots of chocolate what... town shirts that with with you know go Bucks on it. <laughs> um, yeah. We are, do you do you live in Columbus? Born and raised. I don't live there now, oh. but I was born and raised in Columbus. I am a uh... Buckeye through and through. Oh wow! Okay. Both of my so... parents went to Ohio State. Yeah. Okay. So so um. Wait, what was <laughs> You're in two different cities. Well, is your man your... Oh, two different cities. Yes, we spend a lot of time FaceTiming one another, and we use technology to um, to communicate, which might be interesting to some of your viewers, and sort of how we're structured, um, as well as you asked who put up your website. Um, my sister is a graphic designer, so she is just she's a quick she's quick 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 with design, and she designed it, put up the graphics, and we actually use Wix um, as a backbone. It's sort of an introductory website uh, design and development um, tool. It's really easy to set up. They make it very easy to change pages, add information, add pictures. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we're putting adult shirts online. Well, it's something that, you know, my sister and I can do for ourselves very easily. Um, I don't have a graphic design background, but I can still manipulate all the tools to get to make the the website work. Um, I could use that website to um, create coupons, share coupons, share mailings. It's really, really quite powerful. Um, I, I have to it again. Wix, W-I-X. Ah, yes. That's a, that's a, uh, we have to get them on the program. Uh, uh, you said you have children. Um, the, uh, always uh, tell us about them. And Is your husband involved in the company? That's all a good question. Um, I have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old girl, and my sister has a um, 8-year-old and 10-year-old boy. Um, my daughter, my youngest daughter, is probably more involved in the business than my older daughter or my husband. Um, my younger daughter you know, is so interested in so many elements of the business. She's helped me at a trade show. She's gone with us to um, factories and helped us create shirts, create some shirts. Um, she's been to the warehouse. She's probably more involved. She modeled for us a bit. She'll draw for us. Um, you know, my husband has his own his own business. He works in um, in finance. Um, he certainly has helped in an advisory sense at times, especially with um, financial related things, financial and accounting. But uh, but yeah, and I actually it's more of a family business than you might think. My mom who is retired. She's been very, very helpful. She worked in uh, media some, and so she understands target marketing, and she's terrific at the trade shows and terrific with kids. So yeah, we will we'll, uh, become a family business in a different way than you might think. So not my husband well, exactly. Probably, yeah. So tell us your website again, and we're getting to the end of uh, our time together. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, it's www.chalk-of-the-town.com. Uh, take a look at our website. Um, it lists stores where you can purchase our product or you can purchase online. And uh, you know, visit our Instagram site as well. Take a look at um, the ways other people have used our T-shirts, and you'll, you'll really understand the product. Hmm. Dan, and a final question from you. No, I wish you. I, I, it's a great concept. I've got, uh, I've got uh, four grandchildren. I'm going to look at that as a possibility uh, for Christmas. If you if you grow your business substantially, do you think the price point of your product will come down? Yes. Okay. I mean, there's economies in production in terms of volume and the, 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 in many areas, and there's no question that would be the case here. Uh, plus, we can... Good. 
Thank you. We've been talking time. with Sandra Mansfield. Uh, she's the um, chief chalk officer for Chalk of the Town, a really unique product. Thank you, Sandra, so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz. 